Hi, thanks for stopping in. Here we are, I think, what is it, six weeks into the shelter in place. And we just, first of all, I wanna say thank you to the members of Clayton Community Church that have stuck with us all these weeks and have tuned in every week. And we also wanna say thank you to a, a group of people that are new to Clayton Community Church. We have all of the analytics and stuff like that so we can tell generally who's watching it and from where. And there is hundreds, sometimes over a thousand more than the average that we had um, on a weekly basis when we were meeting. And so we just want to say thank you. We, I've said it before, you have a lot of choices that you can look around and and for whatever reason you've decided to make us a regular part of your week and we are very very grateful for that and we don't take it for granted um, so it's amazing how we can all be connected um, there's people watching different parts of the world which is mind-blowing to us but it's amazing how well we can be connected through the device i'm holding in my hand right now um, but there are things that uh, we need to do that's more local to where we're actually at. Last week I talked about how we are supporting some local ministries here. One of them called Monument Impact and another one called um, Love a Child. And we kind of wrestled with that this week because a lot of you don't know who they are and you're not from around here, so it doesn't really mean anything to you. But what we settled on is that while we are all able to connect around the globe through devices and computers and stuff like that, there is something that we all should do in our own individual town. So if you'll just take what we do for Monument Impact and Love a Child as a metaphor for what you can do, where you're at because wherever you're at there is a organization just like love a child just like monument impact that are just providing things and food and clothes and whatever resources people in our community need there's somebody in your community just like that so i'll segue as we start this week to talking about giving and we believe in the biblical principles about giving and on tithes and 10% of our income should uh, be given back to the Lord. Uh, we believe all of that. But in addition to that, we have a heart for our community and we want to be effectively using our resources collectively to make a difference. So if you feel so inclined to give to this church, we would very much appreciate that. and. Um, we will make sure that we use it well, um, but we want to encourage you to find something in your own community, wherever you live, to make a difference. Find somebody that's doing it if you can't do it yourself. And so we just wanted to start with that. Hey, let's do something fun before we get into worship. Uh, why don't you put in the notes or uh, whatever platform you're in, whether it's Facebook or YouTube or Church Online, if you can put where you're watching from, like what city, state, country, if it's somewhere besides America, and uh, let's just have some fun with that, even what you're eating for breakfast, if you're eating uh, bacon. It sounds really good right now. I think I'll have some bacon. So, yeah, I'll do that. Put it in the comments right now. All right, enough chit chat, let's go to church. Working in this place 
God, we believe it. Yes, we can see it. The wonders are still what you do. Bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. Oh, God, we believe it. Yes, we can see it. The wonders are still with you. Let's sing those verses again. The mountains are still being moved. The strongholds are still being loosed. Oh God, we believe. Yes, we can see. The wonders are still with you. Bodies are still being raised. And giants are still being slain. Oh God, we believe it. Yes, we can see it. The wonders are still what you do. We are here. Verse 2.
is the moon. Yes, we need a moon. And this is a moon. You're sweeping in. This is a moon. You're washing it all away. good to see you on this day. Um, I uh, want to talk to you about a kind of a hard subject. What I want to talk to you about today is the greatest fear of all. You see, uh, like it or not, um, we all fear something. Uh, and I know that that became so real for me um, one time, uh, quite a long time ago now. We had just started Clayton Community Church. We were brand new. And it was such a joy-filled time, such a time of celebration. And yet in the midst of that time, uh, we had a young mom in our church um, who had a daughter who was four years old. Uh, I have three children, my wife and I, and our daughter was also four years old. They were playmates. Uh, and one day the little girl got sick. The mom took her to the doctor. Um, and the doctor said, oh, she's fine. She just got the flu. And she said, no, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Uh, and three days later, uh, the little girl died. Um, you can imagine just how shocked that family was. Uh, and I remember that day uh, of the funeral, um, I went with the family out to uh, the cemetery. Uh, my wife was with us and everyone was just in shock and, and, and just crying and grieving. And, and yet I was the pastor. I had to hold it together. But I will never forget that day when um, they brought out this little casket, a uh, very small one for a small child. Um, and I remember thinking, this is the size of the casket there would be for my daughter if she had died instead. Um, now, in that moment, I was the pastor. I was the one who was there to bring comfort and, and hope and help. And, and, and I remember in, in that time, I, I held it together and I, I was there for the people who needed me. Um, but it was still a hard day. And I remember that night, uh, my wife and I were at home and, and we had a family member visiting and, and we were watching this movie. And, and in this movie, out of the, the blue, one of the main characters just dies in a car accident. And I just lost it. I literally lost it. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, my wife didn't even know what to do. She said, "What, what can I, what can I do? And, and, and how can I help?" And I, I said, "Just, just give me a moment. Just give me a moment." Because um, it kind of all came crashing down on me. I, I realized in, in that moment that that um, I was afraid. I was afraid that um, I couldn't protect my little girl. I was afraid um, that uh, I couldn't ultimately protect any of my kids from harm. I, I mean, as parents, we, we always try to do our best, right? We don't want to put them in, in a harm's way, but, but ultimately, um, we can't prevent every hard thing from happening. 
Um, and, and, and so I, I share that story with you because I realized that, that during this COVID-19 season, uh, most people are, are, are hesitant to admit, admit that death is a constant companion in times like this. Um, and could it be that most people fear death because they don't know what happens after they die? So I want you to think about that. I, I know I think about that. Uh, I mean, 25 years later, my kids are grown and I, and I still worry for them and for my grandchildren. I, I want to protect my wife and my family. And, and, and yet I can't always do that. Uh, and, and so the truth of the matter is here is that none of us can. We can't prevent harm. We can't prevent trials. We can't prevent every difficult situation that comes along. And certainly we can't prevent death. We're all going to die. See, that's the, that's the reality here. Um, and though we can't prevent that from happening, um, we can prepare for it. And, and, and so today what I want to want to say to you is, is that I really believe that God is here to provide you with hope and encouragement and confidence to face the greatest fears of all, especially death. And, and so as hard as it is to talk about that, uh, I want to address it. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says this. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. And, and, and so the big question in all this is, is God trustworthy? Can I really put my faith in him? How does he keep me from fearing death? And, and, and I want to see what God sees. I want to know what God knows. And, and in that, in that, I believe that God will help me and he will help you to not be overcome with death, to not be over um, paranoid, to not be in, in the fetal position all the time <laughs> because it's so overwhelming. But that, that in this, that we would see maybe a different perspective. Because here's the first thing I want you to know. God has a different perspective. You see, from God's perspective, uh, suffering and death is temporary. It's not the end. L listen to these words in Isaiah. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, we think life is like this, and eternity is like this. But the truth is, it's just the opposite. Life is so short. Life is so short. And, and there will be joys, and, and, and there will be hardships, uh, and, and someday we are all going to die. And, and for us, we think that's everything. But really, that's such a small part. Let me tell you, the reality is, is this is life. This is eternity. This is eternity. And I know that in this life, I want to prepare myself for what's after I die. I want to have God's perspective. I want to see that bigger picture that, that, that gives me an eternal perspective. You see, here's the other thing I want you to see about God is that God sees the other side. You know, one of my favorite passages about heaven is found in the book of Revelation. I don't know what you think of when you think of heaven. Some of you think of fat little cherubs. Some of you think of streets paved with gold. Some of you think of an eternal Disneyland. I don't know if heaven's going to be like that. Um, but I, I do believe that what John saw in his vision was a vision of, of the truth about heaven. And, and this is what he says. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Now, here's the part I want you to see. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying. Or pain. 
for the old order of things has passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Wow. Wow. What do you think of when you think of heaven? Well, um, here, here's the thing. What, what God shows us is that heaven is not a consolation prize. Eternity is real, and it is a place where there's no mourning or crying or sorrow or pain. You see, there's so much more. There's a story that Jesus tells uh, when his friend, good friend Lazarus dies. And they, uh, he's very sick at the time. He hasn't died yet. And, and, and so they send for Jesus. And, and he, he's, he's quite a ways away. And, and so it's going to be quite a, a, a long time to get there. Uh, and, and the interesting thing about it is that they say, Jesus, we got to hurry. we got to hurry. Uh, you know, he's going to die. And Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, um, you don't have to wait for the end. I'm right now the resurrection and the life. The one who believes me, even though he or she dies, will live. And everyone who lives believing in me does not ultimately die at all. Do you believe this? And so Jesus waits. And when he arrives later, two days later, Lazarus has died. And the sisters are, are, are crying and they're, and they're so upset. And they, they say, Jesus, if only you had been here, our brother would not have died. And then in the shortest verse in all of Scripture, mostly when people say, do you know any Bible verses? Here's the one you want to tell people in John eleven thirty five. 35. It says that Jesus wept. And there's been a lot of speculation about, about why he wept. I, I think it's because Jesus saw the bigger picture. And he wept for their unbelief. He, he, he wept because he had to snatch Lazarus from heaven to show him that he was real, that he was truly the resurrection and the life. Because where Lazarus is gone was far more glorious, and now Jesus was calling him back. And that's exactly what happens. Jesus calls Lazarus back from the dead, showing that, that there is nothing more powerful than God, not even death itself. Truly, that, that's what the resurrection shows us, right? We just celebrated Easter a little while ago. That nothing can keep God down. And when we put our trust in Jesus, nothing will keep us down, not even death itself. Because you see, this life is not the end. Now, when I understand that, when I know that, then that, that changes everything for me. I mean, none of us wants to, is looking forward to dying, right? I, I, I don't know if I'm so much uh, uh, afraid, but just, um, just sad. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe, I, you know, how I go, how you go. I, I, we could talk about this all day, and it's kind of a morbid conversation. But, but for me, uh, I just know that that knowing just this gives me hope, even in the face of death. And certainly, that's all around us right now. Now, now it's interesting that even Jesus' closest followers, his disciples, they were troubled about this. You know, Jesus, what happens when, when we die? What, what, what's going to be next? And, and this is what Jesus shares with them. It's found in John chapter 14. And Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then he talks to them about how even though he's going to be leaving them soon, that, that the Holy Spirit will come and, and, and they will not be alone. That's the beauty of this. And then this is how he ends this conversation. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You see, when we think about death, our hearts are troubled. We are afraid. And yet the truth of the, the story is that, that God says, look, I'm, I'm with you. So I just want to share with you three truths about God. 
The first is this. God is completely sovereign. Now, what do I mean by that? When, when I say God is sovereign, it means he's completely in control, possessing supreme authority and power. And, and when we're referring to God, sovereignty means that nothing can happen out of God's express plan and purpose. You see, when I know that God is in control, I can trust he will work everything out. The psalmist says this, The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart throughout all generations. You see, if just one thing is out of God's control, that means I, I can't place my trust in him. That means that my eternal destiny is in question. But, but here's the truth of the matter is that I believe with all my heart that God is completely in control. I love the way Paul said it to Timothy, a young man going into ministry. He said, I know whom I believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. There's no one greater than God. Now, now here's the hard part, is, is why does God choose some to die and, and, and some to live? I mean, in our church, we, we've prayed of a lot, for a lot of people who are sick, and some have been miraculously healed. And some, their healing came in a different way than we planned. Um, their healing was in heaven. And, and, and when I think about that, it, it, people will ask me, well, why do some people die and, and some people are healed? And here's my answer. I, I don't know. I don't know. But I know that I am going to pray for their healing. And, and if whatever answer God gives me, I will I will trust him in that. I do believe that prayer makes a difference. And I also believe that there are times when God says, here's my answer. Because heaven's not a consolation prize. Now, now I, I don't know if you can live in that tension. I do all the time. Um, and, and that doesn't make God any less powerful or, or any less in control. It, it, what it does is, is it tells me that, that there is more than this life. And I will keep looking to the one who is the giver of life. And, and, and so the second thing I want you to know here, and also the second truth about God, is that God is infinite in wisdom. Listen to these words in Romans. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his past beyond tra tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, I, I believe that God knows what he's doing. You know, there have been so many times when I, I thought I knew best. I know when I was younger, I had my life all planned out. I was going to live in Southern California. I knew the girl I was going to marry. I was going to, I was majoring in business uh, in college and I was going to be successful in business and make a lot of money. And, and let me just tell you, none of my plans worked the way I planned out. Nothing. But you know what? God is so much wiser. Um, I, I have a completely different life than the life I thought I was going to have. But oh, it is so much better. Because Jesus is at the center. Now, I, I didn't become the big successful businessman, as you probably know. But I married the greatest wife. And we've had this incredible life together. We, I hope to have many more years together. This June will have been married 35 years. And my only regret is that I didn't ask her to marry me sooner. What was I thinking? And I know that throughout these 35 years, there's been good and there's been hard. But, but through it all, God has, has kept us together and, and God has been at the center of our love and our relationship. I need to trust that God knows what he's doing. A third truth about God that I want you to know today is that God is perfect in love. 1 John 4, 9 through 10 says this, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You know, when I look at my situation, God seems cruel. But when I look in the Bible, 
I see that God is love. The, the very nature of love, the very essence of love, the, the stuff that love is made of. God's not a byproduct of love. God is love. In fact, I, I believe that without Jesus Christ in your life, you will only love second rate. You'll never experience the, the truest and most pure love there is, the love of God. And that affects everything else. And, and, and so when I look at this world, I, I know we see suffering. We see hurt. And, and yet we also see that God did not spare his own son. It's the most famous verse in the world, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You, you see, this is part of God's plan. This is God's plan. God sent his son. God gave his son freely. His very own son. His very own son as a sacrifice for the things we've done wrong. Jesus gave his life willingly to pay the price for the things that you and I have done wrong. So when you see the Bible, what do you see? I see God's love. And I also see God's bigger picture because, because Jesus knew that death was not the end. The Father knew that that was not the end. The Father knew that there was so much more. Romans 5, 8 says this, for God, but God proved, but Christ, let me try that again, but Christ proved God's passionate love for us by dying in our place while we were still lost and ungodly. So, so the question I have for you is, is when will you trust God enough to be free from fear? And let me just suggest two things. I believe that we will be free from fear when we know him in a personal and intimate way. Psalm 910 says, Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. You see, looking to God makes sense. And I am convinced that when we know Jesus intimately and personally, the closer we are to him, the more our fear goes away. The story is told of a doctor who had a patient in his room. He, his office operated out of his home. And, and the patient was afraid of dying. He was, he was paranoid about it. He says, he's in, he says aren't, aren't you afraid, doc? And, and, and the doctor said, no, frankly, I'm not. And he says, why not? And just then there was a scratching on the door. And the doctor said, you hear that sound? That's my dog. He says, uh, my dog has never been in this room before. He, he's never been on this side of the door. But he hears his master's voice. And so he's eager to be here. Because he knows that I am good to him. And I love him. Now, that's an imperfect analogy, I know. But, but the thing about it is, is, is that when we know what's on the other side, or when we know who is on the other side, it's a whole different thing. Some people believe it's just lights out and it's over, but I don't believe that's true. I look around me. I, I was taking a walk this morning. I, I, I look around me and I see this incredible creation, and, and I can't conceive that this is all for naught. I can't believe that there's something greater than us holding us together here. And, and that when we know the Creator, when we know uh, God in the flesh, when we know Jesus, that we will be free from fear. It doesn't mean we won't ever have fearful situations. But ultimately, when I put my trust in God, I know that my life is in His hands. And that is a place where there is ultimately no fear. 1 John 4, 18 says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. See, God is real, and I don't want to walk through death without Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
You know, it, it's interesting because in our church right now, um, we have a, a number of people who have some very serious sicknesses. Uh, most of them are cancer. Uh, and, and someone commented to me about this the other day. They said, Sean, why, why are there so many people in our church who, who have all these serious diseases? Is this where they go to die? And, and my answer is always the same. I, I think this is where they go to live. I think this is where we go to live and find hope. And, and that's, I don't want to be our, our church to be a place where people just go to die. I want our church to be a place where people learn how to live with gratitude in their hearts for God, knowing that God is in control and no matter what comes their way, that he will never leave them. They will never be alone. So the irony of, of this whole message this morning is that uh, as I was planning this out, uh, I, I didn't know that this week would be a very hard one where there's a woman in our church who's had a very serious cancer and has come back and uh, and she's a little younger than me. Um, and uh, she is very near to the end. But, but it, it's been so amazing to watch her and her husband and all this. Um, she said to me before it started getting really bad, she said, you know, I, I have peace. I have peace because I know God's with me. And her husband who's been caring for her said to me, he said, you know, it's been an honor to be able to care for her in this time. And and so I went and saw her just a few days ago and, and um, it's it's pretty serious. Um, and so we, we talked about that. It was no time to shy away from, from that. Um, I, we, I, I, by saying, I, I read scripture to her um, and uh, told her how much my wife and I loved her. And uh, she mouthed the words, she couldn't, can't even talk right now. She mouthed the words, I love you. And that meant so much to me. And I, and I said, I said, just so you know, I believe with all my heart that this is real. I believe that what's waiting for you is a glorious eternity. I believe those words in Revelation, that heaven is a place where there's no mourning or crying or sorrow or pain. And then I said this to her, I said, you know, the reason I keep talking about this with people, the reason I keep sharing Jesus is because I know that, um, that you will be in heaven, probably before me. And someday I'll get to be there and I'll see you again. And, and right now I want to share Jesus with as many people as possible because I want as many people as possible to join us there, to be with us. You know, no one left behind, right? Um, I've been thinking about that a lot. I want you to know that your eternity is secure. I want you to know the Lord of the universe who is real and who loves you, who will never leave you, who will see you through the greatest fears you can imagine with hope and security and maybe even peace. I don't want you to go one more minute without Jesus. So I guess the question you have to ask yourself is what makes life worth living and dying for? Paul said it this way. He said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's an interesting statement. How would you answer that? For you to live is what? What would you put in that blank? What, what is the most important thing in your life right now? For me to live is my what? Golf game? To die is to probably not be playing golf. For me to live is my money, my job. For me to die is not to have those things. For me to live is my spouse and my kids. But ultimately, I can't protect them from everything. And if I die, I certainly can't. 
But if for me to live is Christ, and if my family knows Jesus, then I know, I truly believe that they will ultimately be okay. That God will look after them even long after I'm gone. So here's the thing. I just want to pray with you because I want you to know Jesus so bad, so bad. I, I, I can't begin to tell you how important this is and how this changes everything for you and for me when we know Christ. So I just want to pray for you right now. And if you want Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Lord, I, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what's going to happen next with this COVID-19 season. But I know the only way I can get through life's difficulties is with you. I believe, Jesus, that you gave your life so that I might know you. So that I might know that you took the punishment for the things I've done wrong. so that I might be your friend. And so, Lord, I ask that you would come into my life to reassure me of your presence, to fill me with your hope, to help me to see that this life is not the end and to have a place in your glorious heaven. So Lord, today I ask you to come into my life, to be my Lord, to protect me, to provide for me, to look over my family, to show me that this life is not the end. Come into my life now. Amen. So here's the thing about that prayer. If you prayed that prayer, would you just do me this favor? Would, would you just like click on the thumbs up emoji there? Yes, I'm in. I'm committed. Okay, you can reach out to us any way you want. Connect with us somehow. But, but maybe today if you say, okay, I'm in. This is what I want. I'm going to put my trust in Jesus. Today's a day for a thumbs up. So, um... We're not immune from suffering. I know that. And this is not a thumbs up to say, I will never have any problems. I will never suffer. I will never have fear. But, but it is uh, saying, I believe you, Jesus, that you are greater than my fear. No matter what comes my way, because I put my trust in you, I know you will see me through it. So I've had a lot of people ask me about why we take communion. And I think that the, the communion is a reminder that Jesus Christ gave his life for you and for me. To pay the price for the things that we've done wrong. The Bible says, greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for a friend. And Jesus lays down his life for you and for me. And so when we take communion, we, we are reminded of Jesus' sacrifice. Reminded that he is the Lord of all and, and that not even death has power over him ultimately. And just after we've just talked about the fear of death, certainly this has got to be the best news of all. That Jesus conquered the grave because he is God. And in taking communion, we say, yes, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. Now, I got to admit, I, I, I've, it's been kind of fun to hear how people have taken communion. Some are, are very serious about it, and they, they try to get the right kind of bread and, and juice or, or even wine. Um, I had someone tell me all they had was uh, berry scone and orange juice. I had somebody else tell me all they had was 7-Up and sourdough bread. Um, so we're not going to be too rigid on this, just so you know. Uh, the important thing is that as you take it, you remember 
on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread. Now it's just a coincidence that I have Dave's killer bread here. Um, that's not the point. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread. And after he blessed it, he broke it, saying, This is my body which is given for you. And so if you're here today and you say, Yes, Jesus, I accept your sacrifice on my behalf. Whatever you use, maybe it's bread, maybe it's a cracker, maybe it's something else. I want you just to take this bread now and taste and see that the Lord is good. And remember that Jesus gave his life for you. The Bible also tells us that after he'd broken the bread, he took the cup, but he says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As long as you take this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So again, I invite you now to take the cup, whatever you have, and be reminded that Jesus shed his blood for you. So taste and see that the Lord is good. Let me pray for you. Lord, I pray that as we take this communion, it's more than just a reminder Lord, that you are present in a special way in this time. I truly believe that. And Lord, uh, there are things that we have to get right for you, with you. And so I pray, Lord, that, that now we would just take some time and just ask you to forgive us for the things that we've done wrong to help us just be made right with you once again, to invite you afresh into our lives. Lord, I thank you for this communion that it symbolizes more than bread or juice or wine or whatever we may have available at home. But Lord, this reminds us that you love us so very much, that you give everything so that we might know you. And Lord, for that I praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, I'm really glad that you spent some time with us today. Now the God who said, behold, I make all things new right now is pouring out new life for your heart, for your home and hope for your future. In the name of Jesus, receive the new life God has for you. You all are dearly loved. God bless.